sponsorship for the show is brought to you by Cherry, data connection and analytics platform powering real estate decision making, helping real estate investors. Go to cherry.com, that's cherry with an E. And our other sponsor is Entre Networking Group, it is a hub for entrepreneurs creating, created by entrepreneurs and they uh, find co-founders, developers, mentors, investors at joinentre.com. We're going to get to the show. Here we go. Welcome back. Leaders Live here with Paul, the CEO and founder of Voxy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Charlie. Yes. Very nice office. Very nice space. Very cool stuff here. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks um, for coming down. I'm excited to get into this. A little uh, intro why we're doing this is basically to understand what you're doing, hopefully connect you with other like-minded business leaders. Uh, you know, a real estate guy, cold calling all the time is a little bit different. I'm trying to add value, put together, you know, this list of 100 plus founders, VCs that we've had on the show and connect you with them. I think that adds more value than just cold calling you about real estate or whatever it is, really trying to add more value than anything else. That, that's it. That's it. All right. That makes a heck of a lot of sense. Now let's, let's pump you up. Let's promote you, right? Uh, and Voxy right now. Uh, Voxy is, you know, online English language training platform right now for global teams. Yeah, that's correct. You guys are kicking ass. Um, yeah, man, we are deep in it. Yeah. It's been a 10 year journey. Um, and yeah, it's past 10 million of ARR. So doing That's big well. news. Big yeah. news. Let's bring it back a little bit though. Give a little context what you were doing before Voxy. Uh, you got a lot of exciting stuff. You were working with the Virgin team. Yeah. Virgin Media, Virgin Mobile, Virgin Hotels, um, and Richard Branson. But can you give us a little bit of background? What were you were doing before Voxy? Yeah, definitely. So I, uh, I was an investor for Richard Branson's Virgin Group. Um, yeah. That's the group that actually started and incubated Virgin Mobile, um, Virgin uh, America, Virgin Galactic, and Virgin Hotels was my baby. I. Um, I venture funded the operating business that manages the hotels mm -hmm. and then raised a real estate private equity vehicle to go acquire and convert commercial real estate assets into hotels. And, yeah. um, you're in the real estate business, so I don't need to tell you how that works. Um, but that was pretty much my dream job. Um, Richard Branson was my hero you know, before, during, uh, and still is. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to the Virgin Cruises or the Virgin Voyages uh, party next weekend. Uh, they finally have their cruise ship launched. But um, yeah, that was what I did prior. Um, you know, I was sort of always wanted to be an entrepreneur and working at Virgin is probably about as close as you can get, but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. um, you're still sort of working for a large uh, organization. And um, um, as, you know, Richard Branson is the envy of all other billionaires, right. but at the end of the day, um, it was still sort of a job. And uh, I, um, I learned a bunch there. I learned um, sort of you know, watching the different entrepreneurs that started Virgin businesses. Right. Um, we sort of had the benefit of getting to see a lot of the companies that were coming through New York. Um, this was sort of back in 2009, 2010. Um, and uh, yeah, at, at some point I sort of got the, um, the conviction around this idea around personalized um, language learning, um, which you know, gave me the confidence to start the company. Right. Before we get there, right, what, what, you, what were some of the tips you learned from, you know, Richard, Sir Richard Branson um, that you maybe you could share with us that you, takes with, you, you, know, you take with you today? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot, first of all. I mean, he's built one of the most, you know, amazing- That could be its own show, guess, Creation right? machines this planet will probably ever know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I learned a ton. A um, couple of things I always point out, um, you know, set attack big markets. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at all the virgin businesses, um, they're in these massive spaces um, where, you know, innovation can drive outsized returns. Um, and he also said, you know, do something that you're personally passionate about because, um, these journeys, as I pointed out, that's a 10 year journey already, right? Yeah. Um, it's thousands and thousands of days that I've been thinking about how you can improve English language learning. Thankfully, it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, if you back up, gosh, 20 years ago, I guess, when I graduated from undergrad, um, I had a sort of a uh, wander lost and, and moved to Santiago, Chile, where I learned Spanish in a very immersive environment. And language acquisition and language learning was something that I was really passionate about. So when I was looking around, um, to sort of leave Virgin and start my own thing. Uh, I downloaded Rosetta Stone's annual report. That was literally how I learned about Virgin Hotels too, was I downloaded Marriott's 10, like their 10K yeah, their annual 10K, report. Right. And that was sort of how I taught Virgin all about the hotel business. Um, I did the same thing, downloaded Rosetta Stone's annual report and saw that in 2010, you know, they barely, they were barely mentioning the internet. Definitely not, weren't talking about mobile yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
And they also were using really the same curriculum to teach every single language to every single person, which was sort of an anathema compared to how I learned um, you know, a second language in, in Chile a yeah. long time ago. Um, so something I was passionate about, it was a huge market, you know, $100 billion of spend, people trying to learn English around the world. Um, and yeah, I started it with a PowerPoint presentation. I raised $600,000 um, from some angel investors that I met partly through Virgin and partly... And this uh, is back in 2010 when you started? Back in 2010, Boxing. yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. At, it was a TechCrunch, right? Uh, yeah, that was 2011, I think. Okay. That was, yeah, it was a really a, a pre-prototype. It was literally just a PowerPoint that basically said what I just told you. Mm -hmm. Big market, yep. no one is using technology well, no mobile, no personalization. Um, it took me about a year to, you know, put a few lines of code together and get some vaporware, which I then launched at TechCrunch Disrupt. And yeah, the, that sort of, I guess, was the, you know, the beginning of, of post-product Voxy. Our, our minimum viable product was started as an email newsletter with like, you know, basically an RSS feed, if you remember back then. Sure. Um, evolved very quickly into sort of a lightweight mobile application that was teaching English from the news. This concept of personalization has always really been our true north. Um, personalization is extremely valuable in education overall, like individualized <laughs> instruction works better, um, but especially with something that's very task-based, like learning a language, the more relevant you make it, the more personalized you make it, the faster right. you that learn. So there was always this sort of learning from the news. Um, but over time, that you know, sort of gamified mobile app evolved into a full online school with, um, you know, we, right now we do about, um, I think, two or 300 classes a day, wow. live synchronous classes with, with professors 24-7. Um, and that was all sort of under the, the, the first phase of Oxy, if you will, which is four or five years where we were trying to be a, a B2C company. Mm -hmm. We were trying to do direct-to-consumer marketing to acquire English learners all over the world. Um, and we learned, again, I guess the hard way after spending millions and millions of dollars of, of venture capital and um, you know, trying very hard to sort of optimize Google and Facebook spend. But what we learned is that the lifetime value of an individual English language learner isn't actually that high. Um, they don't study English forever, so mm. you're not going to, you know, it's not like Netflix or, or something like Spotify where you're going to pay them forever. Um, they pay you for a finite amount of time, and then at the same time, it's expensive to, you know, to acquire audience and to acquire, um, you know, paid subscribers. Right. So we pivoted the business to its current form, which is, you know, selling our online English learning platform to, uh, you know, corporations, universities, and schools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you've obviously grown the team pretty good. I mean, we got to be honest. Yeah, we're, um, I think we're about 60, a little over 60 people right now. Yeah, that's um, solid. Yeah, we, um, the, the vast uh, majority of the demand for our services, English language learning, is actually outside the U.S. Right. Um, so we have sort of a focus in Latin America and Brazil, a 30-person office there, um, also about 25 people here um, in, in, in downtown New York, and then a few uh, How did you, I, I mean, you're talking about the services are, are outside, right, in Brazil, whatever. How did you identify the markets? I mean, you talked about going big, right? Going for the big markets, how 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 did you conceptualize, look at that, and say we're gonna we should be going out here or here? Yeah, I mean it's a good question, and like most of these things, it's, it's sort of half luck, half strategy. The original idea was actually teaching English to the immigrant population here in the United States. Yeah. Um, when we launched our first uh, mobile app, it was an I, I couldn't find an Android developer in New York at the time, but I was able to find an iOS developer. Okay. So we built an iPhone app. Um, and I guess not surprisingly in hindsight, like immigrants in the US didn't have iPhones. However, if you had an English learning app uh, that was on iOS, you, we got crazy downloads all over Latin America, right? Like wow. middle class yeah. and sort of upper middle class, Mexicans, Brazilians, um, actually all over the world, even you know, throughout Europe and, and, and Asia as well. They started downloading and, and ultimately, you know, we grew to about 4 million users on the consumer side. Um, but again, it was sort of half luck, half strategy. We originally thought it would be immigrants, and then next thing you know, we're like the number one rated education app wow. in all of these Latin American countries. Um, that was enough for me to start going down there, seeing if I could sort of optimize our media spend. Met an enterprise sales guy. Um, we'd also raised some money from Pearson, a big yep. education company that had a big operation in Brazil. So I network networked my way in. Uh, with the Pearson team, and then yeah, next thing you know, I was selling you know fifty thousand dollar a year contracts to schools. Um, sold a lot of those, and that was sort of the beginning of the of the pivot to B two B. It's a great story, though. That's a nice uh, success story, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's like lots of successes, lots of failures. But yeah, like yeah. any of these, uh, like any of these. Um, 
these these journeys. It's a good road. Good yeah, road to be. Yeah, it's definitely Let's talk road. about the uh, the company culture. It's a segment we have sponsored by Hugo Team, which is searchable meeting notes nice. uh, with your favorite tools, connected with your favorite tools. But cool. talk about the company culture at Voxy. What is it? And you know, what do you instill with your team? Um, yeah, I mean, culture is as I'm sure everybody who comes on this show will tell you. Um, especially once you get past you know, a handful of people, it becomes a really, really vital mm -hmm. ingredient to get right. Um, and I think Voxy's done, done, done pretty well, and, and we've been fortunate in that we sort of punch above our weight because we have this impact focus, right? Where our mission isn't to get people to click on more ads, our mission is literally to improve the language right. proficiency of somebody, you know, we get, um, our learners contact us, you know, hundreds of people a day saying thank you because they actually, you know, for the first time were able to, you know, learn English and they were able to get, you know, a better job. They were getting able to get a promotion. They were get, um, they would, you know, were accepted into a degree program. Sure. So we have that sort of mission f first. Right. So as a result, you know, everybody from engineers to salespeople gets to feel really good about their job. That's right. something super first, helpful. First yeah. and foremost, very very helpful when you're trying to rally a group of you know disparate professionals with very very different skill sets, very very different interests, yeah. um, but. At the end of the day, I think everybody likes to help people succeed, um, and that's you know that's really our mission, right? Help help people accomplish their goals by breaking down the world's language barriers. Right, right. Um, but we also do, you know, we have uh, um, eight values that are really important. Um, I can't stress enough. I was going to say, if you could remember important. all those, <laughs> yeah. more power to you. I'm not going to rattle them all off. Yeah. Um, they're all under the umbrella of sort of do the right thing. Yeah, like the old Spike Lee line, um, and you know, it's starting with empathy, and it's um, it's communicating courageously, and, and lots of other things, but. Um, you know, that's, I think, again, fairly tried and true at this point, whether yeah. it's Amazon's 18 principles or, mm -hmm. you know, um, having really, really clear values that dictate behaviors is, I think, cr critical to getting yeah. a bunch of people on the same page. Well, let's, let's focus on the communication aspect. How do yeah. you, I mean, we, we like to talk about, you know, I guess, efficient uh, work efficiency in, yep. in communication. Like, how do you make work efficiently and communicate it with your team? Like, are there tips that you have um, yeah. In the environment? Although, uh, yes, definitely. And I think efficiency of communication is key, though. In our, um, in sort of the way that we pick up that, that the importance and, and the critical nature of communication is probably a little bit more than just efficient. It's, it's, it's sort of about providing context mm -hmm. and about making sure that everybody understands, you know, everything that's going on around, you know, their day to day yeah. and providing, like I said, the context so that people can do their job better, knowing how it's impacting our learners, knowing how it's impacting right. our um, customers. But like the efficiency, as, as, as you brought up, um, and that, that platform that you said about Team notes sounds interesting, by the way. But like, I mean, Slack and and you know, there's, there's a number of different systems you can use. We our whole company runs on like Asana, Jira, and Slack, and those things definitely drive more efficient communication. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to communicating courageously, you know, it's about um, speaking your mind. It's about being respectful. Um, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, Going it's back about to empathy, over, yeah. Yeah, yeah, empathy, and yeah. and really over communicating. I mean, one of the things that I learned when maybe when we were like. 19, 20, 21 people is, even in a group of that size, you can start to get rumors and communication breakdowns. And, right. and the human mind goes to weird places when you have imperfect information. So like a big part of my job became, and any founder CEO goes through this, but becomes like just saying the same things over and over and over again. You get sick of hearing yourself yeah. say it, but it's really about just you know driving that sort of drumbeat message so that everybody is on the same page and, and has the same you know sort of super set of information that they can can use to guide their individual um, contributions right. and their team their team's contributions that makes sense solid very solid uh, before we get to what's next and what you're doing with promotion uh, just trying to get people to check in and then submit some questions for Paul uh, Lexi is going to be taking the questions in just a little bit so start submitting those questions and uh, interacting with each other but what's next for Voxy? Uh, I saw you're hiring. Um, you know, always hiring great people. Yeah. Um, Is there anything else? Are you dropping anything new? Any? But what's um, going on? Yeah. I mean, so we are. We, we've done a pretty good job just iterating on the pro the product throughout. You know, we have nine patents, and we have this really powerful recommendation engine, and this uh, ability to create you know, highly individualized learning pathways for people. So the product has sort of always been in a, in a, in a good evolutionary state. Um, and we've been doing a lot of the pick and shovel work about just getting, you know, B2B sales working. Like it's non-trivial to get, you know, demand generation and, and, and marketing flowing through to well-trained account executives that can close deals and, 
you know, a predictable amount of time and then getting those deals you know, implemented and renewed. So that sort of mm -hmm. sales math is, yeah, yeah. Um, has been, I'd say, our focus for the last you know, four or five quarters. Happy to say we're sort of getting it and it's starting to see the results. Um, you know, we grew 27% last year in ARR, which was um, awesome for us. We were really proud of that. Um, we also started to build out our channel network. So we have direct sellers, you know, that are in Mexico, Brazil, Latin America. And we also have a network, a global network of resellers that we enable and they sell our product alongside theirs. Yeah. Um, and that business is starting to generate, you know, many millions of dollars um, and should probably double over the next 12 months as well. Right. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's mostly about go-to-market sort of strategy and efficiency. Um, but that's, that's, that's where we are. Right. But if you need that job, go to Voxy.com. Was it Voxy? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're always hiring great people. Yeah. We're hiring engineers. Um, we're hiring. Um, yeah, we're definitely always uh, can't go to Voxy.com uh, careers. Yeah, get some tips from this, and then maybe you know call Paul and try to yeah. sneak away in the side door. But that's all right. Um, partnerships, collaboration. You know, what what are some partnerships that work? Collaborations that have worked. Why have they worked? Um, yeah. So. I'd say there's a, there's a couple of really big partnerships that we've been focused on over the last, call it 12 to, to 15 months. Um, I mentioned that the majority of demand for English language learning is outside the U.S., yep. thus our large office in Brazil and our sort of sales efforts um, outside the U.S. But there is a, a really, um, you know, acute problem with immigrant upskilling and sort of career readiness for the immigrant population here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, about 4% of the demand for English language learning that immigrants have, which and you can imagine how important that is, right? They're trying not just to get jobs, but to understand our healthcare system, understand the education system, right. be able to speak with their kids' teachers. This is a, a really acute problem. Um, so towards the end of 2018, is that right? Yeah, we um, raised some money from um, one of the uh, Walton family offices, um, which is helping to upskill, uh, sorry, have provided the capital to Voxy so that we can help upskill these immigrants. Right. Um, we all sort of canvassed the landscape and thought, how can we add the most, um, have, have the most impact on this population? And language and literacy skills are sort of, you know, first uh, you know, top of the list. Um, so we've been working really, really diligently trying to sort of map the market mm -hmm. for um, you know, what we call new Americans. It's sort of the, the, I guess, the modern day way to say you know, immigrants. Right, the American um, dream. Though. Yeah, the American dream, and they're new Americans, and they're new to our country, yeah. um, and they have you know, significant educational needs. And um, we've been fortunate enough to partner with a number of organizations um, ranging from like Chibani that does a really, really good job um, investing in training resources and training programs for their um, employee base. Maine Health is another example, um, Jobs for the Future. So we're, um, yeah, we're really um, sort of establishing ourselves in, in, in sort of the, the fabric of this um, this upskilling movement that's that's going on. Yeah, for people who want to help the community, community, help themselves get better. I mean, it makes sense. All yeah, around, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Pro Logis is another partner we're really really excited about. They're one of the largest um, warehousing and distribution. Um, I think they have 900 million square feet of warehouses all over the yeah, country, yeah. Um, and um, obviously have a lot of um, sort of need for frontline employees. And um, we just signed a, a really nice partnership with them that's going to help um, you know thousands of their employees. Uh, Know, access high quality education online through right. Roxy. So that's interesting. I mean, you're identifying the group that, that needs this, that would help them, and it helps you yeah, as well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Um, what about the building your network aspect of it? I mean, you've, you're attacking big markets. You, you obviously need to grow your network, meet interesting people or business people that you potentially could partner with. Um, you know, it could be more than just going to a networking event and being on a panel on a Saturday or something like that. But what, you know, how do you grow your network? I mean, do you have any tips um, on LinkedIn? Obviously, people are trying to grow their network. Yeah, I know. I mean, LinkedIn is obviously an invaluable resource. Yeah. Uh, in, That's in, the easy layup, though. You in, can't do LinkedIn. In terms of networking. But no, I'd say, um, you know, again, I spent a lot of time, I mean, I've, I've been to sort of Brazil and Latin America probably a hundred times over the last uh, five years just doing sales calls and hiring people and building the, the office there. And then shifting my, my focus to the U.S. market over the last 12 months and really starting to think about um, who are these influencers and who are these um, these organizations that, like Prologis, like I said, or Chobani, that are hiring yeah. you know, a number of new Americans and um, are, are investing in um, you know, their skill acquisition and their upskilling. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're always sort of looking to network and to, you know, uh, 
let's say forward thinking chief learning officers and chief human resources officers um, for you know large right. uh, or for companies that have large uh, employee populations, um, you know where uh, you know language skills can 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 really make a right. difference. Heads of HR, possibly. yeah, heads of HR, you know. Um, uh, Lynn McKee from Airmark, for example, like executive BF VP of HR at Airmark, they have I think a quarter of a million people working for them. Um, you know, people like that uh, would, are sort of where we're focusing the, the the chief learning officers and the chief human resources right, officers right, right. of large companies like that. That's David Rodriguez from uh, Marriott's another example. I think you're skipping a little bit. I mean, we're, those are some of the people you want to connect with, though, too. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna. I usually ask, right, uh, people who you want to connect with potentially to network with and hopefully LinkedIn community could do that. So I think those two are good yeah. ones right there. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. No, I mean. no, no, it's fine. But I think those two are definitely, we should tag them on here. We should send this to them and okay. hopefully we could help you network with them as well. Yeah. That's solid. But let's do the uh, Q&A. Lexi's got some questions. I think uh, our guy Andrew Cohen possibly submitted something from you. Andrew? Yes. Andrew Cohen, CEO of Brainscape, said you briefly mentioned Voxy's pivot from B2C to B2B. What has been the biggest challenge Voxy has faced thus far throughout that transition? Good question, and hello, Andrew. It's been too long, man. We're overdue for a catch-up. Um, well, so the transition happened over five years ago already. I think it was May of 14 is when I came back from one of these trips to Brazil where I, ended up, I came back with like a $50,000 contract and I was like, this is a lot easier than driving, you know, paying tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to drive traffic up against the landing page and get these individuals to, yeah, yeah. to convert into a paid subscription, especially because a lot of our target consumers didn't even have credit cards. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and so it's been about five years since that, you know, transition I say has, has took place. Um, the challenges were numerous. I'd say, you know, entrepreneurs, have uh, the, I don't know if it's a pro or a con, but they have the ability to, <laughs> to, to switch gears pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so it took me about a week to realize that I was no longer a direct consumer, you know, B2C company, that I was now a B2B business. I literally, you know, came in on a Saturday the next week after the pivot and I set up Salesforce, like our first instance of Salesforce, and I started entering, you know, all the people that I met. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of it, but I mean, it's, it, it really is an entire organizational shift. You, you know, you touched on culture before. Yeah. Um, I would say the cultures associated with consumer businesses and, and B2B businesses are, are very different. Right. Um, you know, it's one thing if you're, you know, you, you know your user as like a, an IP address or a, as an email address. It's a very different thing if you're taking them to dinner or if you're having your sales team, you know, call on them personally and, and you know, you're sort of committing in a, in a, in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. Different size mm -hmm. contracts, different. Um, different level of customer relationship. Different target audience. Yeah, yeah different target audience, sure. and and lots of. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the lessons I learned, I think, is I tried to repurpose our as much of our consumer marketing team from from the B two C team mm -hmm. to our B two B marketing team, yeah. and honestly, that didn't really work that well. Wow. Okay. Um, it was sort of you know one of those lessons learned that you know you, you sort of pivot hard where everything changes and it, it takes an organization you know many many months if not years to to truly sort of reorient themselves around a new you know north star or whatever right it goes um, back to the communication you were talking yeah, about too. yeah yeah, yeah. Culture, I mean, yeah. At, at that point because you know again we, we went from like zero to a million of revenue in eight months and then to three million the next year and at that point you know the business was so sort of amorphous and most of these people were hired thinking it was a consumer business and all of a sudden we're you know, yeah. sending invoices to, to universities in Brazil for, to, to get paid. Entirely different business, entirely different processes needed. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, communication, I, I would do weekly all hands at that point, because right. just to reinforce the message. Um, thankfully, we haven't had to make any uh, pivots quite so extreme since then. Um, that's but interesting. we have shifted strategies. Yeah, no, but that's interesting. I mean, it's that, that period of time when you did shift strategies that you actually had to focus down more on the communication aspect yeah, of yep. it and figure out who the target audience is and how the strategy to approach them. That's yep. that's a good piece of advice. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely critical. You can't, you, you, you can't, oh, you can't, you can't communicate too much. Yeah. Um, Lexi, what else we got over there? Good? Yes, another question from the audience. What have you found to be the most effective tool for teaching full-time working professionals who do not have an abundance of free time to learn a new language? Oh, that's a great question. And um, it is true. A lot of our population, especially these new Americans, um, the, I think the term is uh, time poor. They are. They really do not have a lot of time between. You know, some of them work are working two jobs and trying to help their kids with homework. And like, you know, life gets exceedingly busy. Yeah. Um, you know. 
our, our approach, for, I mean, first of all, the fact that we are online and, and have actually the full um, experience, like the full program is available on mobile, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, also, the way that we have um, our, sort of our pedagogical approach, which is task-based learning, lends itself very well to micro-learning. So we do have sort of short bursts of learning content that can be done in transition, in commutes, in subways. In subways. Yeah. yeah, we actually last year rolled out like an offline feature because not feature really. It was but being, no being able to yeah. use to use a lot of the learning objects in an offline environment. Right. Very um, helpful. Yeah, all of that sort of helps people fit the learning into fillable time. And the other thing is, um, you know, online learning has the benefit it, we solve issues of time and space. Right, you don't have to commute to a school. You don't have to sit for that hour, hour and a half at a, at a predetermined time. You can, you know, you can truly use use your fillable time. Yeah. And then the final point I always make is that it's just a heck of a lot cheaper. Right. Like we are able to offer significantly superior learning outcomes for a fraction of the cost of what it would be, you know, typical to sit in a room with an English teacher and a textbook. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the benefit of SaaS and software. Where we're able to deliver a much lower price, higher quality right. experience. It's good. It's good. Do we? Okay, that's it. I mean, uh, what we'll last we'll leave off with is uh, your words to live by, personal mantra, ethos. You know, something that gets you going. You said you had a few, but you know, um, what, what? What? Yeah. Is it for you? I mean, I always tell people to like think two moves ahead in their career. That's something all the people I mentor. Um, you know, a lot of people, are, I feel like, are very short-sighted in terms of when they think about their career. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a long journey. I'm thinking a couple moves ahead of, like, what if I'm about to take this job, what is the sort of skill set and what's the, what are the, the talents I'm looking to, to, to nurture and develop for mm -hmm. the next job after that? And if you can actually visualize a couple moves ahead, I think that um, always helps. And the other thing is, um, you know, I feel like 99.9% .9 of your job satisfaction is about the people you work with. So. Um, you know, we, we talked about networking and the importance of, ma of meeting people. Um, you know, just be careful who you decide to work with. That goes from investors to board members to um, to your, your executive team, just down to the people you have to, you know, your, 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 even the people you're selling to. You right, know? right. I mean, like for an entrepreneur, if, if you don't like the people you're selling to, uh, you're in for sort of a, <laughs> a much less exciting and much <laughs> less gratifying journey. Because, um, like, you know, business is all about the people. Oh, that makes sense. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's solid. That's all we got. In the, let's just leave off again with the, the names of people you want to connect. Oh, I with. mean, th those are literally just just two of the. I mean, you, you, uh, you said a couple though. I mean, the head of H, anybody in HR, anybody who. Yeah, like there. CLOs and uh, uh, big companies that have large workforces. Right, and, right, right. Or right. potentially immigrant populations. The one that I uh, Aramark is this huge company right. that services you know un uniforms and food and everything. Uh, so that was the one I was thinking of. Um, their right. you know, executive VP. Those types members. of companies. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, cool. We're going to tag them on here. We're going to tag everybody on here. We're All right. Get you some business, hopefully. Well, you know? thank you very much, Charlie. It's been All a pleasure. Right, cool. That's it. The doll's going to hit the music, and that's, uh, that's it. And then we have a little bit of a... Uh... That's it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. The heaviness in the music is undescribed.